So looking at this slide, you can see that there are a number of compounds and chemicals that are produced by tobacco smoke that impact our health. You can see that many of these compounds in tobacco smoke are items that we normally do not consider consumable. You can see here that tobacco smoke has hexamine and butene, which are found in barbecue uh, lighter fluid and additional lighter fluids. Toluene is an industrial solvent that's commonly used. Arsenic is a common poison. Cadmium, a heavy metal battery, all that's found in the tobacco smoke, which puts us at risk for developing a number of malignancies. Similar to combustible tobacco smoke, e-cigarette users also are exposed to a variety of these similar toxic and carcinogenic compounds during the vaping process. And specifically, there have been found uh, toxic and cancer-causing compounds observed in the urine of e-cigarette users. This has not been terribly well studied, but with that in mind, we studied it. And what we did is we reviewed the scientific literature on carcinogens in the urine of e-cigarette users. And we found that there were about 1,400 different scientific papers on this topic. When we narrowed them down strictly to what we were looking at, that being the carcinogens in the urine of e-cigarette users, we found 22 studies that met our topic inclusion criteria. When we reviewed those studies, we found that there appears to be 40 different parent compounds that are in the urine of e-cigarette users that are known to have a, cause, a cancer cause in human, in addition to four metals that are cancer causing. Of these 40 different parent compounds, our bodies metabolize them. And as a result, we found that there are 63 unique toxicant and carcinogenic metabolites in the urine of uh, e-cigarette users. Let me just go back to that slide one sec. And that the take home message is of all of these, there are six compounds in the urine of e-cigarette users that are directly linked to bladder cancer. So with that in mind, uh, this has been the springboard from, for some future, excuse me, future investigations that we're doing at the molecular level to look at the changes of bladder cells when it's exposed to carcinogens found in the uh, e-cigarette vapor. Uh, with that, Rich, I'll turn it back to you. So we've discussed at this point the um, real causal risk in, in developing bladder cancer. And I think it's important to understand that there is risk for continued use after the diagnosis of bladder cancer. And taking another step back here, um, hearkening back to some of that population level public policy discussion from earlier, we've seen very nicely that some of the progress made in, in preventing people from, from smoking and having people quit smoking has really translated into good outcomes as far as lung cancer goes and as far as some of the other very closely related smoking related cancers. Now, lung cancer has seen a decrease in the incidence, meaning how many new cases per year, and it has also seen an, an improvement in the survival rate at one year. However, and unfortunately for bladder cancer, uh, both the incidence rates, that's how many new cases per year, as well as the survival rates have remained largely stagnant despite all of this progress at the population level in getting people uh, to stop smoking. So this is important because continued smoking after the diagnosis of bladder cancer has some well-described uh, outcomes. And, and no matter what your treatment strategy or your treatment necessity is after your diagnosis of bladder cancer, smoking after that will actually relate to a worse outcome. Now that's whether you're having your bladder removed, having the bladder scraping procedure where just the uh, tumor is taken out of the bladder through the urethra, um, continued smoking will lead to higher risk of anesthetics, especially under general anesthesia when the ventilator is breathing for you uh, because of some of the lung damage associated with it. There have been very nice papers recently published that have shown that continued smoking 
uh, in patients getting chemotherapy actually makes the chemotherapy less effective and it increases the risk of adverse effects in patients getting chemotherapy. Similar findings have been shown in patients who are undergoing radiation, where the radiation has worse uh, side effects in the bladder and elsewhere and also has a lower and attenuated treatment benefit uh, where it is not as effective. And all of this actually leads to real uh, changes in, in the, the hard outcomes. These are the recurrence rates, the survival rates, uh, the risk of secondary malignancies. And we know that continued smoking will increase the risk of, of patients having a recurrence in their bladder, uh, whether uh, that bladder recurrence is uh, treated with uh, chemotherapy in the bladder or just scraping. And it also increases the risk of second cancers. So these are cancers that are not bladder cancers, but uh, about 12% of survivors of bladder cancer will go on to develop a second tobacco-related cancer. Now that's whether that's lung cancer, head and neck cancer, uh, gastric cancer. So this is a, a substantial uh, risk in people who continue to smoke afterwards. And other epidemiologic studies have really shown that quitting smoking is actually uh, one of the most effective ways of improving your own uh, chance of having a long-term good outcome and a long, being a long-term survivor of bladder cancer. So this is really one of the most important things that uh, anyone can do after a diagnosis of bladder cancer in addition to hopefully quitting before this diagnosis happens. Now, what we've shown in some work that we've done recently actually is that despite the fact that um, most patients' bladder cancer diagnosis is related to smoking, there is still uh, a troubling, uh, troublingly high uh, percentage of patients who, who do continue to smoke. And we looked at uh, both kidney and bladder cancer, which are tobacco-related cancers, and that's in the orange there, and then um, the blue is prostate cancer. Um, and although some of the rates of smoking uh, before diagnosis were certainly higher in, in those tobacco-related cancers, persistent smoking afterwards uh, was upwards of almost 20% of people diagnosed. Um, and you can see here on the right in panel B, uh, the, the uh, use of, of e-cigarettes, uh, although not as high as traditional cigarettes, uh, is still persistent. And this is potentially an issue because of what Dr. Bierlin mentioned, that we're not certain that e-cigarettes are actually any safer um, than tobacco cigarettes, and there may be some persistent risk because of the carcinogens in the urine. So when we look at uh, uh, bladder cancer and kidney cancer patients in, in isolation here a little bit, roughly 15 to 20% continue to smoke, and, and this is um, more so than, than prostate cancer survivors who, who, who do not have a direct tobacco-related cancer. Now, we know quitting is hard. There is most certainly no judgment or blame being placed on anyone who continues to smoke after diagnosis. That is most certainly not the goal of any of the work we do. This is a, truly a partnership and something that we want to help patients do. And I think it's important to understand uh, just how difficult quitting is and, and how this does require help uh, from your support system, from your family, uh, and from your physician, uh, certainly. Um, most of the patients who have been diagnosed with bladder cancer have tried quitting, and this is uh, more than 50%. And, and this just shows basically uh, how often pe people are trying to quit and how important it is to continue to try to quit. Um, and it's, it's, it has been shown that uh, roughly 30 or more quit attempts are at times necessary uh, for someone to actually be successful in quitting. And a lot of this may relate to uh, less effective quit strategies, uh, but that's really where us as the urologists uh, hope to come in and really help uh, intervene at that point. The other thing that's important is not only helping someone quit right off the bat, but it's also maintaining that quit um, and maintaining the abstinence from cigarettes. And, and what we showed in this study here was that as time went on after the diagnosis, the percentage of patients with a cancer history actually increased in each year after diagnosis. So uh, people were seemingly very motivated to quit after diagnosis, and then as time went on, uh, people uh, did not have the same uh, level of abstinence and, and the use of uh, cigarettes was increasing as time went on. And that's why it's really important not only to uh, quit at the onset, but also have support um, from your doctor and from your family and your support system to remain uh, abstinent from cigarettes after the diagnosis.